So many years ago, um, I got, had a difference of opinion with a family member. And uh, uh, it really got to the point where it looked like we were just never going to speak again. And uh, uh, I was trying very hard not to express what I was really feeling in my heart and what I was really thinking and to guard my tongue, which can be a challenge when you're upset. Uh, it, it is so easy uh, to just let loose and to let somebody know what you really think. It's not productive, but it is something that can feel really good to do. Um, and uh, fortunately, uh, I guess I was having one of those moments, I say rare moments because uh, I sometimes feel like I'm not living in the moment of trusting and relying on God, but that particular time I was, and God gave me the self-control uh, not to express what I was really thinking. The family member was just trying to egg me on and just trying to push me to the point of saying things. Now, we were not living in the same space, you know, there, there was quite a bit of distance between us. And so uh, most of that egging on had to take place in the form of letters. You know, you know those things that people used to write a long time ago, you know, and uh, that, that I know I can see that expression, letters? Who writes letters? Well, guess what? Uh, a good 30 years ago and longer than that, people usually actually used to do that. You know, that's, uh, that was before smartphones and texting and, and everything else. That was still in the age where the phone company was uh, encouraging people to reach out and touch someone. You know, that, that's how long ago this was. And uh, I decided to say something which the other person found extremely unsatisfying uh, because that's not what they wanted. They wanted me to come back with something. They, want, they wanted something that they could sink their teeth into and, and just really hash this out and, and say what was really on their mind. And... I sent back a, a letter, and all I said was, I love you. Well, I said a few other things, but that was the basic message, was I love you. You know, it, it's like, uh, I, just, I, I can't go there. I can't deal with this. I can't talk about this. Uh, you know, and that was the only thing. And, and uh, fortunately, uh, I don't know how long after that, the relationship actually started to heal and to get better. And... Uh, and it's been restored in the meantime. But if I had uh, let loose with what I was really thinking and feeling uh, and the turmoil that I had at the time, it probably uh, either would never have been healed or at least it wouldn't have been healed by now. Who knows? But anyway, that, that's the, 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 you know, the, my story of my own experience, which turned out rather well. Uh, but it doesn't always turn out that well for us. And sometimes it's because when somebody eggs us on, we, we actually say what, what's really inside us, and that's not always a good thing. So uh, the name of the message happens to be Repent, and uh, <clears throat> I put these words up on, on, on the title slide, Stop, Think, Think Again. That's not the entire definition of the word repent, but this idea of stopping and thinking and rethinking is part of the concept of repenting. Uh, in my life, you know, whenever you know you see the word repent with an exclamation mark, it's it's usually because uh, it's tied to the idea of screaming at somebody and telling them that they got to get their their act straight and they need to uh, make things right with somebody else. And you know, all of the burden is put on the person who is in the wrong to make things right, and they are told how horrible they are, and that they need to repent. That really, that kind of an approach really comes out of the old-fashioned hellfire and brimstone uh, approach to preaching, where you, you just want to, you know, make people feel as guilty for what they have done wrong, so that eventually they're just basically uh, humiliated and intimidated and scared into making things right. But that's not actually God's idea of repentance. And, uh, and, and God does things very differently. And we're going to find out in today's message how God does it differently. And because of the way God does things, it actually can stimulate somebody to stop what they're doing, to think about it. And this think again part, it's, it, it's this idea of, 
I'm thinking about it and maybe there is another way. Maybe I need to think about what's going on around me differently than I have been thinking about it. Because repentance doesn't actually happen until somebody thinks differently about the situation that they find themselves in. So that's why I've got that on uh, the title slide that I came up with. Getting into the definition of repentance, the most common definition that I ever heard in my life, and you've probably heard it too, is the idea of turning around. You know, you're, you're looking in one direction, and then you turn your back, and you turn, and you face a completely different direction. You turn your back to the things that were causing the problem. And because you're turning around, you're basically changing. You're changing the way you think, you're changing your actions, and when that happens, then restoration becomes possible. So that's why people always, when they talk about repentance, they always talk about turning around. Uh, but they don't necessarily talk about the fact that a person needs to actually stop, think, and rethink, and consider. And so there's a process that's going on inside the person who ends up ultimately doing the repentance. Uh, but even with that being said, I want you to realize that where we're going to go with this uh, message today is we're going to be going with the message from the point of view of what does God do that brings about the repentance? Because God is actually the one who starts all of this. So our key question is, how can God help me repair a broken relationship? Uh, my, my idea here is that because God is an expert on repairing relationships that are broken between himself and mankind, that if we look and understand at what God is doing, we can take those ideas and we can incorporate them into how we live and how we relate to other people where the relationships have been damaged. And in the process, we can start to begin the process that will end up resulting in the other person's repentance. In other words, the other person deciding that the way they've been thinking about things and the way they've been acting hasn't really been working for them and they want to change that. They want to do something different. But we are, in a sense, we're, we're at the starting gate. We're the ones who actually begin this process. And if we know that to be true, uh, then we can think about things. So our key idea is that love searches for an opportunity to restore relationships. In other words, just like in that scripture reading of the parable of the woman with the lost coin, she was the one who did the searching. She was the one who was looking for what was lost. And likewise, in our own lives, when somebody has pushed themselves away from you and said, that's it, I'm out of here, I'm not going to have anything to do with you, even if, uh, if they're the ones who've done something wrong and you've tried to correct it and they're not listening to you, uh, the, the burden is on you to be able to look for opportunities to be able to restore the relationship. That's what God does. And so what I'm saying is that's what you and I should be doing as well. We should be searching for opportunities to restore the relationship. So our passage happens to be in 1 Timothy uh, chapter 1, starting in verse 12. That's where we're going to be at in the scriptures today. And uh, uh, we're going to find out how this is going to work and how Paul uh, tells Timothy that things should work. So in uh, verse 12, in the beginning of verse 13, Paul says, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who has given me strength to do his work. He considered me trustworthy and appointed me to serve him, even though I used to blaspheme the name of Christ. So he's basically talking about a relationship that was restored. He's talking about the fact that at one time he was more separated from God even than he realized at the time because he was doing things to slander the name of Christ. And I highlighted the I used to because that's what I wanted to go to uh, do a word study on. And basically, in the English translations, if you just say used, that, that's not going to make any sense. So there are elements in the Greek word, which technically the most accurate translation is used, that include I. 
and previously did. You know, it's, it's, it's a Greek word that takes ownership for the action and basically indicates that that was something that I, the owner of, did at one time. I just don't do that anymore. So the word study is that we're talking about that this is something that was. This is something that's in the past. It's something that I formerly did. It's got the ownership, the taking of the responsibility. And because it has ownership and responsibility, it is a word of humility and a word of honesty. So all of those things have to be part of how we go about repenting. If we're going to repent of something, we have to recognize there's something that we did. We have to recognize it's something that we don't want to do anymore. We have to think differently about it. But we have to have the humility and the honesty to take ownership and responsibility. And you know what? Whether a person is dealing with, you know, uh, a division in a relationship, they have to be willing to do that. If a person is dealing with a substance abuse problem, they have to be willing to do that. We don't get to the place where something is in the past until we are humble and honest enough to own and take responsibility for what we're doing in the present so that we can change the way we think about it and not do it anymore. To be able to turn our back on that and say, that I am not doing anymore. I am done with that. That is the past. And it's especially difficult for people with substance abuse problems because they emotionally do that and then they find themselves through whatever circumstances in life, they find themselves back there and so they have to go through that process again. And sometimes they have to go through the process many, many times. And I did a funeral this week for somebody who was going through the process. Unfortunately, they just didn't live long enough to get past it, to work it through. The, the, the problem got to them before they could solve the problem. So, uh, you know, there are time limits on this sort of stuff. There are natural consequences. I talked about that in one of my sermons from, you know, several weeks ago about the, the idea that God allows things because he allows us to experience natural consequences. And when we experience natural consequences, it's not like God is letting it happen because he doesn't care. God lets it happen because that's, I mean, you have to recognize that if you don't change the way you live, you know, it could end up being the most extreme consequence, the consequence where you don't even have life here on earth anymore. The person that we did the funeral for was in Christ, and so they will spend eternity with God. So they, God hasn't, you know, forsaken them and turned his back on the person, but it's just that it's caused a lot of grief for those who are left behind. If we want to get to that place of where something is in the past, we have to address this. And that's one of the hardest things for people to do. Because to address this and to be very humble and very honest and to take ownership, there is that part of us that has to deal with something that we just are kind of embarrassed and ashamed to deal with. We, we, we have to get to the point where we say, you know what? My shame and my embarrassment is no longer an issue for me. It's, you know, everybody's known, everybody gets it. You know, I might as well not try to pretend that I've got my act together because everybody knows that I don't have my act together. So when you get to the point where you just don't care about your reputation and you're willing to just say, okay, I own it. You know, I'm not gonna try to pretend that I'm something other than what I am. That's when we get to the place where we finally can turn the corner. We finally get to the place where we can say that is now going to be in my past. So Paul was talking about what was in his past and the way that he treated other Christians and the way he treated Christ and the way he was trying to destroy the church. That was his shame that he needed to address. And then he goes on in the rest of verse 13 and says, in my insolence, I persecuted his people, but God had mercy on me because I did it in ignorance and unbelief. So I wanted to focus on the idea of mercy. Because mercy, if we can understand what mercy is, then we can look at the circumstances of the relationships that are broken in our own life, and we can recognize that even though the person has not yet owned what they have done, they have not recognized that what they have done is wrong, they do not feel ashamed or embarrassed by it yet, 
we want to be able to show mercy. And sometimes people say, hey, I'm not doing anything until they say they're sorry. That's not the way it's going to fly in the kingdom of God. In the kingdom of God, the mercy comes before the repentance. And that's a hard thing for us to recognize because our own emotions, just like I told you about, you know, that circumstance with a family member of mine, I had to say, I love you. I had to start off with the idea of showing mercy to the other person. If I wasn't willing to do that, then we probably would still be divided from each other even now. So the word study on mercy is this idea of seeing, seeing, feeling, and providing something. You know, you see a need. Mercy is that you see the need, and then you actually feel a kind of kindness and a concern for the situation that the other person finds themselves in. And ultimately, you end up providing help. I mean, mercy ultimately is all about providing help to somebody who is in need. Hard to do when your relationship has been damaged and destroyed and you're separated from the other person. This is one of the things that God does for us. When the Bible talks about the fact that, that, that God blesses the, uh, the, the sinner as well as the saved, you know, those who have rejected him, you know, the rain falls on their crops, you know, they, they bring in a crop, they're able to prosper, they're able to survive, God blesses them just as much as he does other people. God is showing mercy. He is not saying what you're doing and the way you live and the way you think is okay. He's not saying that you're now restored to me. He's saying, I see that you have a need and I'm going to help meet that need. I'm still going to be there. And, and I've had people tell me that, you know, I, I, I've never believed in Jesus. And, and, you know, if you're saying that God takes care of me, well, then I can clearly see that God's been taking care of me. I've had everything that I need, you know, pretty much most of everything that I want. I mean, my life has been okay. Why are you saying that I need Jesus when it seems like I've already got everything that I need? Well, that's because while we're in the flesh, while we're here on earth, God looks at us and he meets needs. Why does he do this? Because he is merciful and because he wants to restore the relationship. You know, if he doesn't meet the need, then what happens? We end up dying and that's the end of that and the relationship is never restored. So God practices mercy with us when we are not in Christ just as much as he practices mercy on people who are in Christ. So this concept of mercy is a really important concept and it's one of these ideas that even though it might rankle you and it might rub you the wrong way and you go well, I don't really want to do that if restoring the relationship is what is important if you see that as the end goal that you want then you want to get to the place where you can see, feel, and provide for the other person. You still have boundaries, mind you. I mean, when God is being merciful to us, he has a boundary, which is until you recognize you're a sinner, until you accept Jesus as your Savior, our relationship is not restored. You're not in my kingdom. You are not enjoying my grace and my forgiveness. You haven't gotten that yet. There are boundaries and so when I talk about the need to express mercy, I want to make sure that we understand that we express mercy with boundaries. You cannot just say, well, the other person has a need, so I'm going to just give up everything that I stand for, and, and I'm just going to let them now start walking all over me and taking advantage of me and doing whatever they want to do. No, you have boundaries. You still say that, no, I'm here, you're there. I'll do what I can to help you, but there are still boundaries. And we're not going to get rid of the boundaries until there has been a change in you. You need to be able to make a change. Once you've made the change, then we'll look at it again and decide what the new boundaries are going to be. So that's why I say you have help with boundaries and this happens before the repentance. It's very important that you understand that this is going to happen before the repentance. If you don't see that, then you're not going to be taking advantage of every opportunity that God gives you to restore a relationship in your life. This is an, an important key thing. So we move on to uh, 1 Timothy verse 14, uh, which says, Oh, how generous and gracious our Lord was. He filled me with the faith and love 
that come from Christ Jesus. So what's happened here is that Paul hasn't specifically said it, but because of what he is saying, he is indicating that he has moved from the place of receiving God's mercy to the place of repenting and receiving God's grace. Because when it talks about being gracious, that really is just another form of the word grace that's in there. And when he received his grace, he's talked about being filled with faith and with love, the things that come from Christ Jesus. So he went from having no faith in Christ and persecuting and blaspheming the name of Christ to repenting of that because God showed him mercy first, and when he saw how merciful God was, when he came to recognize how wrong he was, he repented of that. He changed, and when he changed, he received God's grace. And so it should be in your life with people that you have broken relationships with. You do what you can to restore the relationship by showing mercy, keeping your boundaries, and when they come to you and say, you know what, I've been thinking about what happened all those years ago. I was thinking about what I said the other day. I was thinking about how I've behaved. And you know, I realize that I was wrong. What I did wasn't right. What I did hurt you. And I am sorry and I want to make it right. You see, the, the repentance, the thinking differently, and the turning away from previous attitudes and previous behaviors is going to follow on the heels of the mercy. The mercy lets that person know that you still love them even though you do not appreciate or accept the way they have been treating you. But that doesn't mean that your love has come to an end. It doesn't mean that you've just put up a wall and said, that's it. We can never restore this relationship. It's completely broken. If that's what you're going to do, then guess what? It'll stay completely broken. It'll never be restored. But if we're going to live like God, if we're going to follow his model, then restoring, rela <coughs> excuse me, storing relationships has to be part of the lifestyle that we choose. So this is really important to us. He goes on in verse 15, and he says, this is a trustworthy saying, and everyone should accept it. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, and I am the worst of them all. Now, is Paul really the worst? Well, that's his opinion of himself. Uh, I would say that uh, uh, he tends to think of himself as the worst. And quite frankly, I think that's reasonable, not because of what he did. It's reasonable because in his mind, he sees that his behavior towards God was horrendous. And every one of us should look at our own sin and see that before God, our behavior has been horrendous. Every one of us has caused the Holy Spirit to grieve. We can look at ourselves and say, well, what I did was the worst. You know, it's not a comparison. It's not a contest. It's just a recognition of honesty and humility before God. That's really all it is when you talk about being the worst. You're owning it. So therefore, you have a greater appreciation for the grace that God has extended to you. In other words, you can say that I'm the worst what you're really saying in that is, I truly don't deserve the grace that God has given to me. And likewise, when you're in the process of restoring relationships, a person can say, man, I was horrible. Man, I, I was absolutely terrible, you know? And if that's the way they feel, and if they feel sorrow and remorse for that, just don't say, oh, no, 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 it was really nothing at all. There, there, there's nothing worse you know, when a child, for example, comes to realize that they have been misbehaving in a way and uh, that they should feel sorrow for it and they should try to make things right, the worst thing to do is, oh, no, no, it was really nothing at all. People always do that with other people's children. Oh, no, no, it was really nothing. No, don't say that. Let the child own what they did and understand it for what it is and to feel sorrow for it and to ask for forgiveness, and then they receive the forgiveness. They need to understand that things that they do are wrong, that they have negative consequences on other people, and it shouldn't be downplayed and treated like it's not anything at all. At the same time, you don't build it up and make them feel like they, there's no possible way that they can ever be restored. You just say, yep, that, that was lousy, but I see that you uh, are sorry for it, and you want to uh, uh, 
uh, you know, make it right. So, okay, let's make it right. Let, let's do that. Let's, let's get beyond this and move on. You know, Paul isn't seeking to have God say, no, 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 no. It really wasn't that bad. It, that's not what Paul is looking for. And that's not what any of us should be looking for. He goes on uh, at the beginning of verse 16. He says, but God had mercy on me so that Christ Jesus could use me as a prime example of his great patience with even the worst sinners. So, you know, you look at Paul's life. You look at the way he was treating Christians, the way he was trying to destroy the church. And you go, well, yeah, that, that was pretty extreme. I mean, Paul was an extremist at whatever he set out to do. He put himself into it whole hog. I mean, he just went for it and didn't look back. And so, in that regard, Paul does become the perfect example because, you know, if, if we're going to be that way towards God, our first inclination is to think, well, God is never going to forgive that. You know, that's why we have, you know, that thing that we refer to as the unforgivable sin, which in the remnant we decided was hyperbole. Whew. But I mean, the idea here is that if, if God is not going to forgive, then w what is the hope for us if God isn't going to forgive? But the fact that, that that is the desire that God has in his generosity, in his gracious generosity, forgiving is what he wants to do. And when he forgives, that becomes an amazing example so that somebody else can look at it and say, well, I've been really ashamed of what I've been doing. But man, if he's willing to forgive Paul, if he's willing to forgive that, I mean, that's really extreme. Okay, maybe there's some hope for me. Maybe he'll forgive me as well. So Paul embraces the fact that he was as extreme as he was, not because he's proud of it, but because he recognizes that now his life becomes an example so that other people will look at their own lives and say, well, if Paul can repent and be forgiven, then maybe there's hope for me. Maybe I can repent and be forgiven. We always want to give people the opportunity to realize that there is always an opportunity to restore a relationship. We don't want people to think that this relationship is broken, it's beyond repair, that's it, it's over and done with. That's not what we want. And so Paul is using this in this particular way. He goes on in the rest of verse 16 and says, then others will realize that they too can believe in him and receive eternal life. So that's why it's important. You have the example, because with the example comes the realization. And Paul is realizing that about himself, and he's going, this is a good thing. You know, the more people know about who I was before, the more people know how shameful my life was before, and then they see the grace of God given to me, the mercy given to me, the grace given to me, the forgiveness given to me in Christ Jesus. The more that people know this, the more they're going to look at this and say, wow, there's hope for me too. So Paul looks at this and sees, okay, I can take something which at one time was horrible and horrific, and I can realize that this is something that can be used for the glory of God. And then he finishes by saying, all honor and glory to God forever and ever. He is the eternal king, the unseen one who never dies. He alone is God. Amen. So he finishes this at the place where we should all be in our relationship with God. When we look at who he is in Christ and what he has done for us. And realize that God deserves our worship. Because that's really what he says, all honor and glory to God forever and ever. He, he's basically saying, now when I consider who God is, when I consider what God has done, when I consider how God started the process of restoring me to him, and then eventually I caught up with the idea and recognized, yeah, this is something that I need to do. He realizes this, and he recognizes that the only appropriate response is to worship 
God. Now, I'm not saying that the people that you restore to relationships are going to, you know, worship you, but they should at least appreciate the fact that the place that they were at before is over and done with. It's gone. They can look at it, and they might say to you, well, why were you willing to do this? I mean, I, I was such a hor horrible person. You know, I, I, I really hurt you. Why would you be willing to, uh, to still consider me to be a family member, to be a friend or, or whatever? And you'd say, it's, 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 it's the love of God. It's God has given me the ability to do this. I look at what God has done. I realize what God has done for me. And I recognize that if God can do this for me, he can do this for you. And if he can do this for you, why am I continuing to hold a grudge? I am going to make this right. And in so doing, if this person is not in Christ, you can offer them the opportunity to receive the forgiveness of God through Christ Jesus. So you, you have this opportunity to then take what has been restored in your world and to use it for the glory of God, to bring them to Christ. So if you have any relationships in your life which are not what they should be, not what you want them to be, then you should be looking at how God has reached out to you and how God reaches out to everyone. And you should be saying, okay, what can I take from this? And how can I use this in my own life in order to restore what's broken there? Our takeaway is that showing mercy is an invitation to repent. That's really what it is. When you see the need, when you feel the, the, the compassion, and, and when you decide that you're going to offer help, that show of mercy, you need to see that that's an invitation that you are giving to the other person. You are inviting them to think differently, to look at what happened in the past and to think about it again, to stop, to stop being angry, to stop holding a grudge, to stop saying, saying this can never be fixed, this can never be corrected. You're asking them, stop, stop all of that. Rethink this. Rethink this because I'm showing you mercy. I'm handing you the invitation. There's still boundaries. We haven't gotten past the boundaries yet, but I'm letting you know that I am open to the restoration. I am open to you thinking differently. I am open to you wanting to change things so that our relationship can be restored. That's your invitation. And I want you to think of showing mercy as an invitation to somebody else. Because if you can do that, then you can heal broken relationships and your life is going to be much better for it.